Leaders from all over Africa meet in Addis Ababa for the African Union Summit. What were the major issues on the agenda and what did they decide? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. African heads of state met in Ethiopia's capital Addis Ababa over the weekend for the 26th African Union Summit. The leaders focused on many of the major political, social and economic challenges now facing the continent. They discussed issues like efforts to restore stability in Burundi, economic development and the empowerment of African women. We begin with CCTV's Robert Nagila for more details on the large gathering in Addis Ababa. Robert. The 26th African Union Heads of State Summit concluded on Sunday with Burundi and the International Criminal Court making the headlines. The theme for this year's summit was African human rights with a special focus on women. On Burundi, the Assembly rejected a proposal adopted in 2015 to send in peacekeepers to protect civilians and property. Instead, a delegation will be sent to Bujumbura to try and convince President Pierre Kurunzinza to allow in peacekeepers. On the ICC, a committee was mandated to come up with strategy, including the collective withdrawal of African states from the International Criminal Court. However, that remains an option for the moment. It's not as easy as it sounds. If that decision were to pass, the leaders still have to go back to their parliaments because those are the bodies that draft and ratify those types of decisions. On Somalia, the Assembly committed to strengthening the structures within AMISOM to make it more effective in fighting the Somali militant group Al-Shabaab. Now, all these decisions are meant to be implemented in the coming months. We will have more on that when the African Union meets in Kigali in June this year. Wabat Nagela, CCTV, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. With us now from Johannesburg is William Gumede. He's an associate professor at the University of Witwatersrand. And from Nairobi, we are joined by Dr. Anita Kiambe. She is a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. And with me here in the studio is Ibrahim Rasul. He is a former South African ambassador to the United States. And he is a distinguished scholar in residence at Georgetown University. Welcome to all of you to the show. William, let me start with you. Broadly speaking, if we look at these issues that were discussed at the AU summit, we've got Burundi. Uh, where there have been protests against uh, the president's attempt to secure a third term. There were the security uh, concerns that are posed by uh, groups like Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, and of course there's the conflict still going on in South Sudan, and then there's a whole range of economic issues that the AU discussed. What kind of progress was made, do you think? You know, I mean, the AU at the moment is really is being challenged um, you know, in the past, you know, the AU made its contribution by, you know, bringing African countries together and helping, you know, to get some uh, uh, reasonable peace on the continent. But the continent right now is faced with a couple of challenges, and I think that the AU currently is really struggling dealing with these crises. For example, I mean, with Burundi really is, you know, there may be an absolute disaster coming there if the AU doesn't step in. And, and I'm afraid, you know, from where I'm sitting, it just seems to, you know, that the progress is just too slow in Burundi. And also, secondly, just in terms of, you know, the rise of fundamentalism across, across the continent, it just seems that the AU also has been rather slow in dealing with those issues. And of course, there's also the economic issue now um, in economic issues across the continent you know many African countries are struggling because of the you know the oil price uh, the volatile oil price and so on uh, that the AU doesn't seem to you know, to, to have played a, a key role there in trying you know to deal with the situation Dr. Kiamba one of the other key themes at this AU conference was women's empowerment did we see any progress in that regard? Uh, thank you so much. I don't think we saw any progress whatsoever being made um, by those who attended the AU summit. I would expect that, um, for instance, they would have touched on quite a number of issues. Um, for instance, the transition from the MDGs to SDGs, which more or less talks about the role of women in development. None of that was clearly highlighted, and therefore I'm quite pessimistic about the role of the AU and um, the members who are supposedly supposed to 
prop up the role of women in development, but it was clearly lacking. We saw quite a lot of other political issues being dealt with rather than women. Well, one of the optimistic things about the African continent right now, Ambassador, is that four of the top ten fastest growing economies in the world are on the African continent. That must all go well for uh, organizations like the AU and for the continent itself. And Anand, I think if you take a snapshot, yeah. that looks good. Yeah. If you look at the video or the movie, when I arrived there as ambassador in the United States um, in 2010, we were boasting that seven of the fastest growing economies um, were in Africa. We were boasting that Africa as a continent was the fastest growing region um, in the world after, um, say, China. Um, and so, in a sense, I think that as a snapshot, it still augurs well. The problem is that we are f going through an oil price um, depression. Mm -hmm. I think commodities are fairly depressed. I think that our number one market, China, is facing some of its internal pressures and shedding a lot of its buying sprees that it used to do in Africa for commodities and so forth. And so the knock-on effect on Africa is, 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 is very pronounced. I also think that when we were speaking about Africa, say, five years ago, we were speaking about 60% of the arable land. We're now speaking about a drought that is gripping and that aid again, food aid, to countries like Ethiopia are beginning to challenge um, even our assertion of the agricultural transition. The key question that I would hope that uh, would have been discussed at the AU is did we use the fat years to prepare for the lean years? Have we made enough progress on the transition from essentially a commodity-based economy to a far more manufacturing and knowledge-driven economy? And we may look back and say maybe we have not done all of that and then to boot, I think, as um, William was saying to us, we are now also beginning to see a backslide on the key achievements that made that economic prosperity possible. We are seeing a backslide in democracy, um, as you've discussed um, in Burundi. We are seeing a return of conflicts from traditional sources like South Sudan, but also from new sources and virulent sources like extremism um, at the hands of um, Muslim fundamentalists in West Africa, North Africa and East Africa. And so I think that um, what the AU needed to, to deal with rather than simply a case by case is to really take stock of whether we are on a downward spiral and if so, how do we arrest it and how do we at least do a holding operation to keep things even if, and then to claw our way back up on the ascent that we were on before? Well, William, the ambassador poses some key questions there. Now, how do you arrest this downward spiral that Africa seems to be experiencing uh, right now? Also, you know, did Africa prepare sufficiently for the lean years after several years of, as the ambassador said, fat years? No, our problem is that, you know, during the good years, you know, when we had the commodity booms, and, you know, we had this really, you know, high growth rates. In fact, the last decade we've seen, you know, you know the longest growth spurts in Africa's post-independence history. Now, our problem has been is that many African countries have not used, you know, that sur the surpluses of the last decade and turn and diversify their economies and, you know, creating uh, new sectors where it's manufacturing and so on. You know, that really is the fact, and, and it's, it's a sad, uh, you know, it's a sad story that we've, we've ended up this way. But back, you know, just to the African Union, maybe, you, you know, I think the continent face again now a political and potentially an economic, economic crisis. And what the AU sort of done, you know, at its meeting now, is to give us a direction. And I'm afraid to say, you know, we, we didn't get that sense of, you know, a new direction. Uh, because, you know, the world right now also, you know, is in crisis. I mean, we are seeing, you know, the U.S., for example, uh, has been uh, is busy putting together a big Pacific trade deal, you know, between it and, and countries in the Pacific. Now, what, where does it leave African countries unless African countries actually get 
their own trade union together as quickly as possible, we are going to be bypassed by all of this development that's going on around the world. And I'm afraid to say, you know, the AU doesn't seem to have actually given us a lead here. Dr. Kiamba, what's your sense of uh, whether the summit recognized these problems that William has been talking about, that the ambassador has been talking about, that beset Africa right now, and whether there was the, the will among leaders at this meeting to tackle those problems? Well, uh, I think a lot has been said about maybe economic development in Africa so far since I think the early last decade. Um, Africa usually has the African economic outlook. And every single year from October to the next October, we usually outline what needs to be done. And um, in this way, I think Africa has already made strides in trying to understand what we need to do in order to have ourselves up when it comes to economic development. But on the other hand, um, when it comes to um, economic integration, we have seen slow progress made by governments in that direction. Indeed, I think um, the last agreement between African nations and between the regional organizations was to come together in agreements. For instance, we had a tripartite agreement between the East African community, between SADC or the South African Development Corporation, and the common market for South Africa, Eastern South Africa. And even with that in place, we have seen still little strides made towards economic development. So one would say that, for instance, the AU hasn't been too serious in that direction. And we need, ultimately, at the end of the day, not to make it one or not to make the integration one in which we are relying too much on political goodwill, but rather to rely on other triggers, on other indicators that are able to lead us towards economic development. Ambassador, to be fair, some of the problems that Africa faces, none of its own making, I mean, you mentioned the uh, falling oil price, uh, that cannot be placed at the door of Africa, although it should benefit some African countries, shouldn't it? And the fact that commodity prices are dropping, I mean, that's a worldwide trend. Look, I think that we can make a case for every crisis that Africa is having as a knock-on from other regions. I think that um, now that there's talk of the United States thinking of boots on the ground in Libya, um, it reminds us who precipitated so much of the instability in the Maghreb, so much of the instability in the Sahel that has now spilled over onto West Africa and kept the fires burning in East Africa. And it comes from Resolution 1973, um, where NATO unilaterally provided the rebels with an air force and deposed and collapsed an infrastructure and didn't worry about the arms. So we can argue that. I think secondly, we can also argue that the outcome of the U.S. Africa Leader Summit that where, amongst others, Africa demanded baseload energy provision and the U.S. came with boutique renewable energy um, solutions that didn't even begin to address the energy deficit in Africa that could have given rise to its industrial revolution. I think we can look at that as, 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 as um, a lost moment. I think um, we can also look, um, for example, at the way in which when we don't hold the line on a coup in Egypt, we will invite coups in other places. And people think it's fair game. And so the point that I'm making is that every one of these, but the African Union has been established with a vision that we are the masters of our own destiny, that we are not victims on the world stage, that we are going to be agents of our own transformation, liberation, and prosperity. And that, I think, is where we need stronger hands. So it's good to see that um, former President Kikweti going to do an, uh, uh, an intervention in, 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 in Libya. I think um, the way in which our detente in Burundi is going to, 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 to work out will show whether Burundi respects the language of dialogue or whether they would have respected the 5,000 troops that would have come in. Those are terrible choices um, to be making. And so, and, 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 and it will also ask enormous questions such as what Mervyn has, um, William has already begun to, to, to ask. Did the money that we made during the fat years circulate amongst elites or did we invest in infrastructure? Did we invest in education? Did we invest in our 2063 vision? That ultimately is the test
that uh, must be passed. Well, I want to get to those uh, questions that you pose, unemployment, education, things like that. But we're going to have to take a break first. More on the African Union Summit and issues that are important to Africans when we return. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat. Welcome back to The Heat. We're discussing Africa and some of the major issues that uh, were discussed over the weekend when leaders from all over the continent gathered at the African Union Summit. Welcome to our guests again. William, the ambassador raised a few points uh, on African development, particularly things like unemployment, bringing the unemployment rate down, uh, and also education. Um, China's president, Xi Jinping, announced last year that uh, there was going to be a $60 billion assistance program for help with development in Africa. How significant would that be towards Africa's development? You, you know, I think as the ambassador said earlier on, you know, it's going to be, you, you know, up, Africa's own development will have to come from Africa in itself. I think, and that really, you know, from the AU point of view, has to be a very key starting point of any development. You, you know, most of our development is not unfortunately going to come from outside. So yes, I, you know, last year China pledged you, you know, money to, uh, to Africa. But I think we must understand the details of those kind of pledges. It's not that China is going to hand over the money to Africans. You know, it is really to support Chinese companies to come, you know, and, and operate in Africa or do business in Africa. Now, our problem is, you know, from an African point of view, is that we don't identify, you know, what do we want to develop and then then we bring our partners you know to partner with us so and that is maybe you know a new role for the au to start must start re-looking at its role in development also i mean it would be you know it would be good if the au can start actually looking at how should, what are the things that should be developed in Africa, you know, how should we develop infrastructure, you know, in order to get an African integration, you know, how should we, you know, what type of, in, you know, companies should we, should we want to bring to Africa, you know, what kind of industrialization and then partner with organizations. My fear is, you know, if we look not only at, you know, the past AU discussions, but also previous AU discussions, is it's, it's almost, there's a sense that we're waiting for, out from, you know, for outsiders, you know, to bring the money and help us develop and that we don't actually look at ourselves and to see what are the things, you know, you know, we've got raw materials, we've got commodities, how do we diversify and then how do we bring in our partners like the Chinese to partner with us? You know, so my fear really is that these really key strategy, strategies are not being discussed in the kind of detail and the kind of political world at AU forums. Dr. Kiamba, is has Africa got the right mix here? Are they developing the right kinds of industries? for a young continent? Are they putting money in the right place? Is the infrastructure plan, uh, you know, is, is it going to work? I think I would uh, agree with the last speaker. Um, however, we do have everything that can make us become industrialized. For instance, we've got a vibrant youthful population uh, who are not only unemployed, but are also underemployed. And um, we are, of course, we do acknowledge the fact that um, that big population does not have an input in the industrialization process. Having said that, we do have quite a number of countries that have come up with um, visions and of course missions and um, an outline that will guide them towards industrialization. However, when you look at um, the kind of resource mobilization and also when you look at um, where it is being placed, I would imagine that it is being placed in the wrong um, sectors first and foremost. Um, secondly, we do find really, um, at the end of the day, like the last speaker said, a lot of over-reliance on external regions to come and tell us what to do. Unfortunately, that has been there since independence. We'd have wished for that to have ended um, in this decade or the last decade or since we attained independence. So I think what we need is maybe um, a set of strategic leaders for each of the countries basically to let us know how we can move on because I would suppose that we do have everything that it takes and one of the fundamental issues or one of the fundamental components is the youth. And like I've said, they are highly unemployed and also underemployed. 
Ambassador, there are also things like so-called quality of life issues, challenges that Africa faces, things like nutrition, safe water, sanitation, energy. Uh, how have African countries done in that regard? Take a country like South Africa, there's been significant progress, hasn't there? No, I think South Africa has had significant progress and I think that at the AU summit, South Africa was recognized for massive achievements in meeting some of the goals of the Millennium Development um, goals that were, that were stated and and, and, and I think that there was justified um, congratulations for a successful fight against Ebola. The problem is that donors often have a far better emergency plan for social quality of life interventions than they have the appetite for staying the course for the long-term preventative development that Africa requires. And the point that I think that um, William makes is that unless Africa is going to devise its own balance, and I think that for a while, uh, driven by the NEPAD, the new plan for Africa's development, we had a template that we could invite the world to. And then we went into a lull, um, and so the world started telling us um, so we were supply driven rather than what was demand driven and maybe the point that um, Dr. Kiamba also makes is crucial that we need champions and visionaries but I would say not simply at the national level we need it at the regional level so we need regional economic integration so that we have regional plans for which roads will unlock the potential which mode of transport will unlock the potential of an entire region what orientation will the education take because we can educate everyone in languages and biblical studies and all of those kind of things but if we've not defined a vision that we will be transforming gold and diamonds in southern africa into jewelry and therefore we need um, this kind of artisanal um, education that will be going on that we will make the square array telescope the driver of much of our technological thing and therefore let us um, invest in the skills of astronomy and science and those kind of things and then devise the syllabi that will feed that kind of thing unless we are able to really integrate at that kind of level um, and hold people to it and seed each country seed a little bit of sovereignty for the overall regional good unless we do that we are always going to be vetoed by the weakest amongst us by the least least visionary amongst us and that's what i think we need to be able to change within the african context william uh, the ambassador mentioned uh, ebola earlier on uh, ebola threatened the west african countries of guinea uh, liberia sierra leone hundreds of thousands of victims died actually is Africa now, when we look at that success story, when, is Africa now better prepared to deal with a crisis like that? You know, let's, you know if, at least if we can learn the lessons you know, from Ebo Ebola and, uh, you know, and, and that really is the challenge. Often it appears you know, from a continental level, we are not, you know, we're repeating the same mistakes over and over. But I wonder, I mean, just to take you know, from the ambassador, whether we may have to start looking at a different African Union, maybe because of the, you know, the kind of crisis that we ha have now, the kind of challenges in Africa, whether the current format of the AU, whether it is still appropriate. I mean, is it, for example, should we perhaps look at the AU that would have, you know, a couple of let's say committed countries with a political will maybe driving you know a one track and then we have you know a second track of maybe let's just say african countries that are not so committed you know to integration or to common development uh, and so on and maybe you know another group that that you, you know that's very very far off you know i'm I, i'm starting to think whether we should challenge not challenge the way the African Union is operating. Is it still, is it appropriate? Is it appropriate model where everyone has the same vote, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, we've got, you know, peop, you know, countries or political leaders that doesn't have the political will to do anything, actually make the decisions, you know, for the continent not to move forward. And maybe for me, that really is the immediate challenge now. You know, do we, how do we, how do we refashion the African Union to make it more relevant for the challenges of our time.
I think William is making the exact point that the AU was making this weekend about the structure and the functioning of the United Nations. Because the United Nations was based on an international model of the World War II that excludes Africa, that excludes large parts of Asia, that excludes South America in its Security Council and its major decision-making bodies. And, but it hasn't shifted for the new millennium to a global governance model in which the smallest can't hold back um, the overall development or the powerful don't monopolize all power. And so maybe I think the point is that the African Union um, needs to also become a model of the reform it wants to see in the United Nations. And that was a point brought up by the outgoing chairperson, Dr. Robert Mugabe, the f president of Zimbabwe, who said it's time for Africa to be recognized and possibly be recognized as one of the permanent members of the UN Security Council. That time has come. I think that time has come a long time ago. And, but, but again, looking at the contradictions, will Africa have the means to send its most competent and capable countries to it, or will it be a, a lowest common denominator discussion that we will have amongst ourselves yeah. um, and disable us from taking up the opportunities of global governance? And Dr. Campbell, what do you think? Is it time for the African Union to take a strong, hard look at itself to figure out are we doing our jobs here? How can we be more effective? How can we solve the pretty formidable problems that this continent faces? Yes, I agree with you. Um, I think it's time for the AU to look at itself much more closely, to look at what we've done wrong, to look at um, the opportunities that are provided for us um, to enhance peace and security in the region. And I think one of the things that is quite crucial for Africa and um, the African Union is to begin developing um, ways and knowledge that will enhance our peace and security. Um, to a large extent, we've relied overly on the United Nations. Um, even though we do get our mandate from the United Nations, the United Nations Security Council, when it comes to matters of intervention in other states, I would suppose that um, I think the African Union has the tools available. Indeed, we have, um, one can say, a lot that we can learn from. We can begin developing, for instance, mediators in Africa. We do not need mediators from outside the region because we already know our problems, really. So I do suppose that, yes, we need to look at ourselves quite closely, look at traditional methods and alternative methods of dispute resolution, as well as conflict management, rather than always um, taking back the issues to the United Nations, even though, of course, we do get the mandate from there. So I do suppose that we have a lot of looking inwards that we need to do and um, of course a lot of studies that we need to do when it comes to the management of conflict, the resolution of disputes that we see between quite a number of states and of course um, you know the political will when it comes to the management of those particular conflicts. Dr. Anita Kiambe, William Gomode and Johannesburg, Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul with me here in the studio in Washington. Thank you all for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. We'd love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and story ideas to the heat at cctv-america.com. And we'd like to continue the conversation on social media. Give us your thoughts and comments on our Facebook page. You'll find that at CCTV America. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.